Family Minute with Mark Merrill, helping families love well. This is Pure Opelka with Mike Opelka. Only on the Blaze Radio Network. All right. All right. You're listening to Ron Brook, uh, filling in for Mike Opelka. Mike will be back tomorrow. Tomorrow. I, I, I've enjoyed this gig. Maybe, maybe he'll let me fill in again. We'll see. All right. Um, we're talking about good stuff. We're talking about the positives. We're talking about positive stories. Airline prices declining, lots more options. Um, traveling all over the world, going to unknown places, unknowable places just a few years ago, maybe a few decades ago. We're talking about the decline in crime, uh, the increase in life expectancy. Uh, we haven't even talked about technology, right? 1990, there was no internet. I remember in 1990, just starting to use email, right? In within the university system, you had email. Can you imagine life without email and texting and and the Google and uh, Amazon? How do we? How did how did we buy stuff without Amazon? I don't know. I have no idea. Um, Technology has just blown this world up. It's just amazing how much good stuff we have today because of technology. The access we have, the, the supercomputers we have in our pockets, our iPhones, our Samsungs, or whatever you happen to use. If, you know, the fact that I can do this show on the internet. Anybody in the world can listen anytime. It can be stored online at a cost of basically zero. And people can access it globally, anywhere in the world, at a cost of zero. I mean, the internet is a revolution that puts to shame the printing press in terms of its potential to change the world. And it's all happened recently, right? The first browser was, what, 1994 or 6? I always get those two mixed up, right? I, I remember using Netscape, having to pay 75 bucks to use it. Now, not only do we have all this stuff, most of it's free. It's, it's, you know, it's pretty amazing. You could have the Blaze radio, the Blaze TV, even 10 years ago. You know, you, you couldn't do it. And yet today, you've got the Blaze and then you've got all the competition. Anybody can start it at a relatively low cost, relatively low cost. It's, it's amazing the options that we have, the possibilities we have. Think about Netflix. You can sit today on your sofa Watch almost every movie ever made, not quite, but a lot of movies, more movies than you ever knew existed. You don't have to go out on your sofa, a click of a few buttons. You don't even have to get up and change channels on your television. How many of you remember that? Very few, huh? Only a few as old as I am. Changing channels with your hand, having to get up every time you want to change a channel. I mean, whoa, life is much better now with remote control. Every piece of music, if you have music streaming service, at, at a very low cost, you can access pretty much every piece of music that has ever been produced from your sofa in your living room. It's amazing. I mean, the, the advancements of technology is stunning. And, and we're getting to the point where a lot of this technology is going to play into healthcare. If we have the, the necessary conditions, get a plane to healthcare. They're going to be able to do gene splicing. They're going to be able to eradicate many of the genetic diseases that we have. Maybe even, you know, before we're born, but certainly the treatments are going to improve. Our life expectancy should go through the roof in the next few decades if we have the right conditions for it. I mean, whoa, we should be celebrating how good life is right now. There's this technology, gene splicing technology called CRISP. Don't ask me what it actually does. But it's amazing. They can change genes. They can, they can, they can go into your genetic code and change it. That is so cool. So cool. And, and by the way, more proof of evolution, right? 
the whole way in which these genes work is, is confirmation of what Darwin believed in. Uh, it, it, that is so cool. It's just science is so cool. And we were discovering so much more, particularly in biology, about, you know, about ourselves and about how to make our lives even better. It, you know, so it's, there's a lot of good stuff in the world. A lot of good stuff in the world. And, uh, you know, think about how much time you spend today online. Now, some people think that's bad. But, I mean, the amount of information. You have access on your phone and your computer pretty much to, to, to all of human knowledge. From pretty much the beginning of time. Again, who would have thunk? Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Life is pretty amazing. Life is to be celebrated and to be enjoyed and the good stuff should be the headline because that is what is dominant we live good lives there's a lot of bad stuff and, and the good lives are being threatened but it's the good that's important in the world and if we emphasize the positive if we emphasize the good and most importantly if we learn the cause of the good then we can better fight for it. Then we can better assure that the future is even better than the present. Is even better than the present. I mean, it really is hard. How many of us thought 30 years ago, 40 years ago, about the possibilities of the Internet? I didn't. I don't know about you guys. And I was programming 30 years ago. I, I was in the computer world, right? I was, I was doing some programming. I, I, I took some computer science uh, courses and so I was somewhat dabbling in that world you could say I couldn't have predicted any of the stuff I have today any of it and that was only 30 years ago imagine what is possible 30 years from now that we're not predicting and I, and I even talked about uber right uber I mean soon we're not many of us young people today don't even have cars they just uber everywhere I mean that's so cool and cheap and efficient Right? And, and who would have imagined Uber? I mean, I remember when eBay first came out, I said, you got to be crazy. Nobody's going to make money on that. Nobody's going to use eBay. <laughs> Was I wrong? <laughs> I've been so wrong when it comes to the Internet. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. Um, so just imagine, imagine. It's hard, hard to imagine what it's going to be like in 30 years from now or what it's going to be like 100 years from now if we sustain the conditions that allow for that kind of growth, right? if we can sustain them. So um, things are good. And what I want to do, what I want to do is after, after this break, we're going to take a break in a few seconds, I want to shift to talk about why. What is it that makes good stuff possible? What is it? that makes progress possible? What is it that has brought people out of poverty? What is it that's created this technology? What is it that makes all these good things possible? And if we can understand that, and if we can know that, and then start fighting for that, I think we have a better chance of winning and sustaining the improvement, sustaining the growth, sustaining you know, the quality and the improved quality of life that we have. All right, uh, you're listening to Yaron Brook. I'm uh, here filling in for Mike Pelka, at least until tomorrow. And um, we're going to take a short break now, and we'll be right back after this. Pure Opelka with Mike Opelka. All right, uh, so we've been talking about how good things are. Uh, all about the good news. And, and I haven't even touched the surface, really. There's so much more. And, hey, if you, wanna, if you want in on the discussion about good stuff, 888-900-3393. We'd love to hear examples from your life or examples that you know about, about how life has improved dramatically, even over the last 30 years. We're, we're, we're mo if you read books, if you read articles, if you read everything, everybody tells you, Ah, oh, things are just awful. Things are just depressing. If you watch the news, if you if you look anywhere, 
it just looks like the world is falling apart and everything is just uh, is just horrible. Well, we're going to be contrarians here. So if you want in, you want to let me know how your life has been better, 888-900-3393. Um, but the real question is why? Why are things improving? Uh, why have things improved? And, and the largest improvement in human well-being occurred during the 19th century. The largest improvement of human well-being occurred during the Industrial Revolution, where we went from being, uh, you know, basically life expectancy of, of, of uh, in the 30s, uh, dirt poor subsistence farmers eating as, uh, everything we consumed, or sorry, eating everything we produced, uh, having no surplus, no vacations, no time off, no recreation, nothing. That was the 18th century and before. Three dollars a day, somewhere around that, was was income in today's dollars was income of uh, almost everybody on the planet. Everybody living in poverty. Everybody on the planet. Ninety plus percent of all people on the planet living in poverty. Two by the end of the Industrial Revolution in Western Europe and the United States, basically most people being rich in comparison to what had existed before. Electricity, running water, the beginnings, the beginnings of air flight, technology, all, all these things are starting. That, that's the biggest jump in human well-being, the biggest leap. Now, we've seen a huge leap over the last 30 years because places like Asia have benefited from all the knowledge and all the success of the, of the West and have implemented very, very quickly. Um, and, and the results are astounding, astounding over there. You, you have to go to China to appreciate just how astounding the progress has been, just how unbelievably good uh, life is there in comparison. You, you go to rural China where they're still very, very poor, and you go to a place like that, Shanghai, and it just blows your mind. Uh, and again, the question is, what makes all that possible? And I think the best way to look at this, you can look at it historically, and, and, and you'll get a kind of a political answer, and a political answer is important, but there's a more fundamental answer, in that, and, uh, answer, and that's to look at your own life. Look at your own life and ask the question, what makes my life better? What improves my life? W when do things get better? When do things get worse? What are the principles by which I can evaluate, just from introspecting over my life, even if you're young, you can do this. What can I do introspecting to my own life to tell whether things, you know, what causes things to improve and what causes things to decline? What causes things to, to, for me to be able to get a better job, to make more money, to live a better life just broadly? What things do I do as an individual that impact my life one way or the other? And, and can I generate any principles from this and the answer is yes you can and the best way to learn about the world is to look at lots of examples and integrate that and 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 figure out the principle behind them and and if you look at your own life if you introspect about again the good stuff and the bad stuff what you discover is that you know well i'll ask you what leads to good stuff when do you succeed and when do you fail? Is there a principle to all the times where you succeeded and to all the times when you failed? Well, let's start with the failure. What leads to individual failure? When do we fail? And I would, I would suggest this. I would propose this, that human failure is always a consequence. A failure that is self-generated, not failure where somebody else comes and clubs you over the head and your life's a failure because they just basically killed you or, or maimed you or whatever. But when it's self-inflicted, when it's self-failure that's sustained, sometimes we fail and then we learn from that failure and we grow from the failure. But real failure, what leads to it? And I, and I think you can see universally, you can see in almost every case, you can see it across the board. Failure is a result of acting on emotion, not thought. 
acting on emotion, letting our emotions dictate truth, letting our emotions dictate action. That's when we fail. We fail when we don't think it through. We fail when we don't consider all the aspects, all the consequences of a decision and action that we take on. Failure almost always is there when reason is absent, when rationality is absent or limited. Failure is there predominantly when people act on emotion, act on whim, act without thinking. Failure is there when people evade, when people don't consider everything purposefully, when they look away because the facts might be uncomfortable. That is what leads to failure, to disappointment, to depression, to failure in life. What leads to success? When you look around the world or around your neighborhood or around your industry, who are the successful people, the most successful people? Now, I know some people are going to say luck, but when you actually examine people's lives, yeah, luck plays some role. I, you know, the best example of this is, is, is the lottery, right? There's this big lottery jackpot, $750 million. You could win it. What happens to most people who win the lottery? It turns out, study after study show, that they live miserable, pathetic lives, that they lose a lot of the money, that they don't enjoy it, that, 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 that they, they land up handing it out to distant relatives, or they just invest it badly and they lose it, or they keep it, but they're just miserable because it turns out that money doesn't buy you happiness, not completely. Money in and of itself buys zero happiness. You know what buys happiness? Making money, producing stuff, earning it. That's what leads to happiness. So if you look at successful people, it's not about luck. Luck is fleeting. Luck doesn't give you the satisfaction of truly earning. And therefore, luck is not what Two leads minutes. to success. Again, you, you can be rich, but not successful. Because success is not about money. Success is not about prestige. Success is about happiness. It's about fulfillment. It's about flourishing. That's what real success at life is. It's about living a good life. Enjoying it. Without conflict. Without stress. You know, stress, a healthy stress. But without, you know, this internal constant conflict. Ayn Rand called happiness the state of of non-contradictory joy, where you're joyous and there's no conflict within that is oppressing that joy. So it's not the joy of, oh, I won the lottery, yay! It's a joy of, I've lived a good life. I've made my life good. I've made some money. I've lived well. One so minute. if you look at people who are really successful, people who are truly successful, what has led to that success? What leads to a life of happiness, a life of sustained, non-contradictory joy? What makes it possible? What makes it possible to innovate? What makes it possible? All the good in the world, where does it actually, actually come from? If the negative is true, if a lot of the 30. distress, a lot of the pain, a lot of the failure comes from emotion, where does the success where does the innovation, where does progress, where does the highest standard of living come from? Where does the decline in poverty come from? They all come from the same place. All right. You're listening to Yaron Brook filling in Ten. from Michael Pelka. And uh, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back Five. after these messages. All right. You're listening to uh, Yaron Brook filling in for Mike. And um, we are talking good news today. Strange topic uh, to do on the radio, uh, strange topic to cover uh, in this era of all negative news and uh, just talk about the bad stuff. And, you know, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to have some negative stuff to say, but uh, I think it's, it's important to put perspective on these things and, and to realize how good life is so you can live it. 
you can live it. If, if you're depressed all the time, if things are all, all, always very, very negative, it's hard to really enjoy life. And I'm all for enjoying life. I'm for happiness. I'm, I'm a huge proponent of happiness. All right. Um, Megan is on the line. She wants to talk about infant mortality. Hey, Megan. Hi, Aaron. Thanks, uh, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, I'm a long-time listener. I'm such a fan. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you do. I, I have some idea of how hard you work, and <laughs> oh, I'm grateful. <laughs> um, I, when you were talking about um, the positives of, of the world we live in today, the first thing I thought about was um, my the most wonderful one-year-old daughter um, of mine. And, you know, when I was when I was about reaching my due date, I expressed some nervousness about going into labor. And my coworkers said, oh, you know, women have been having babies for a long time. <laughs> and, um, sorry for the background noise. And I said, yeah, but they mostly die. Yep, and sure. it's amazing, like, even 200 years ago, m- most childbirths ended in the death of either the mother, the child, or both. I mean, 75% of kids you know, never saw the age of five. Yeah. And I'm, I look at my beautiful daughter and I'm so grateful. I live in an era where there's all kinds of medication and, and, um, and procedures to make sure that she was safe and healthy and, um, and thriving. Absolutely. I mean, the number one cause of death for women was childbirth. I mean, mo- many, many women, or a huge percentage of women didn't survive it. Never, and, and, of course, sometimes oh, yeah. the baby did survive. Sometimes the baby didn't survive. But it, 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 the, the progress we've made is astounding. And, we, and, and that's great, a great example. When we look at our children, you know, we should say, wow, thanks for progress. <laughs> you know, thanks for, for medical yeah, progress. The thanks for the States, progress in I mean, Go ahead. Yeah, historically um, – Life insurance for women was was more expensive for women during childbearing years than after. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so we've come a long way. Where you might worry a little bit before you go into childbirth, but not much because you know that you've got uh, you're in a, you know if you do the smart, you're in a hospital. You've you've got nurses, you've got doctors, uh, you've got uh, surgical procedures, you've got all these uh, the, the, this technology available to you. That's going to keep you alive. That's going to keep the baby alive. That's going to keep you both healthy, not just alive. And and that the chances of a child uh, uh, being born and then dying before the age of ten are minimal today in the in, in America and in in the Western world and even in the rest of the world now are, are really minimal. And and you can enjoy your children for, for a long, long time. I mean that that's massive. That's huge. That's huge. Great. Thanks, Megan. Thanks for calling. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for oh, listening. No, I was say, it still uh, happens. We, there's still stillbirths. There's still women who die in oh, childbirth, yeah. and it's tragic every time. Um, fortunately, that's much, much less the case now than even 100 years ago. Yeah, and, and the fact that it still happens in the United States is, is I think, a travesty. And, and the fact that there's still people who live in such poverty or get such bad health care as, as some people do in the United States is sad and a travesty. And and the cause of that, in my view, is is the degree to which we've socialized medicine in this country. If you have private insurance in the U.S. and and uh, if you have a, a a vibrant competitive insurance market, and uh, you have the best healthcare in the world, but unfortunately, we have created a healthcare system that's priced so many people out of the market because of so much government intervention into our healthcare system. Megan, thanks for calling. It is uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, I really appreciate uh, I really appreciate you listening, and uh, it makes it easier for me to do what I do when I get uh, positive feedback. Uh, thank you. So thank you. All right, we've got uh, let's see, we've got Dave on the line from Portland, Oregon. Hey, Dave. Dave, you there? Uh, yes. Hi, Ron. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, great, great. Yes. Uh, yeah, I wanted to weigh in on the uh, the positive. Uh, things uh, on the call here, and um, the, the two things that I wanted to share are, uh, one is I've been studying objectivism since 2014, and, you know, I definitely consider myself a work in progress, but 
but both, you know, personally and professionally, it's made a huge difference in my life. And um, so thank you for that. That's and brilliant. The, the, the second thing is um, I'm a music teacher and something that technologically that has made a huge difference is a video conferencing for me. Oh. Um, you know, as an artist, you know, uh, inspiration, I think, is so key. I'm mostly a teacher. I, I'm not performing as much these days. I'm mostly teaching. Um, but it's afforded me the opportunity to study with, like, some of the best people in the world Wow! Uh, by video conference. No, absolutely. That, and, that's amazing. And that's true of every profession. We can, now, we can now take classes from superstar teachers who can actually make money by providing education uh, online, uh, they're not limited to by what universities pay or what schools pay. They can actually deliver education to mass audiences or to selective audiences who are willing to pay a lot of money because these teachers are so good. So it's, 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 it's an incredibly exciting time w when you look at technology and you look at what technology makes possible. Yes. As a matter of fact, I was just sending a thank you email looking forward to a coming conference uh, this Sunday, and I thought, man, I've got to give your a call and, <laughs> and share <laughs> the – well, always good to hear from you, Dave. Thanks for listening. Thanks for calling in. And, and absolutely, I mean, there's another whole way in which we're using and going to use the Internet to educate ourselves, to you know, put, put aside the, the benefits of education. I could be traveling anywhere in the world, or Megan could be traveling anywhere in the world. My, my kids are too big to talk to me while I'm traveling. But Megan would be traveling anywhere in the world, and she could communicate with her young daughter, via uh you know via the internet by skype or, or some other software why you know uh, what do you call the the facetime on on the phone and 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 have a real eye to eye exchange even if you're ten thousand miles away i mean how cool is that when i when my kids were little and i traveled i could talk to them on the phone but the phone is just not the same as video conferencing particularly with little kids so yeah i mean the technology makes our lives so much better and we we take it for granted and we don't appreciate it and again i want to turn to the question what makes it possible where does it come from so we just talked about what what where bad decisions come from where, where the negative in our lives come from i, I want to turn after this quick break we're going to take to where all the good stuff comes from where progress comes from but where in our own lives success achievement and ultimately, happiness comes from. All right, you're listening to Ron Brook, filling in for Michael Pelka, and we're going to be right back after these messages. Radio Network. You're listening to Pure Opelka with Mike Opelka. Part of the next generation of talk radio on the Blaze Radio Network. Well, you still got a, another hour or so with Yaron Brook filling in for Apelka. He'll be back tomorrow. And we're talking about where does all this good stuff come from? How do we get it? But, you know, that's kind of on a societal level. But even as, in, even as individuals, what is the origin of success? Now, people, people say, well, liberty and freedom and capitalism. But where do those come from? That's not self-evident. How do we get capitalism? What is the thing, and, and capitalism is not responsible for my personal success. I mean, the fact that I live in a relatively free country certainly is. But what made it possible for me to succeed in this free country where other people don't? Is it just IQ? Is it my genes, as some would have us believe? Is it the fact that I grew up in a, I don't know, in a particular household with particular parents in a particular environment? Is that what led to my success? Or anybody's success? No, if you introspect and you think about when you were successful in life and when you fail, we talked about what causes failure, following emotion, evading, not thinking things through. What leads to success is the opposite in a sense. It's thinking. It's using your mind. It's using your reason. It's getting the facts before you make a decision, thinking it through and integrating. If you suspect that you need more facts, going out and getting them. Not evading, not evading reality, not evading your own emotions, not evading who you are, not evading who other people are. Facing reality, dealing with reality as it is, as compared to dealing with reality as you want it to be, as you wish it would be. Dealing in reality as the way you would 
emotionally like it to be. No, dealing with reality as it is. Challenging yourself intellectually. Not, I'm not talking about your math problems. I'm talking about day-to-day stuff. Using your mind and applying them to everything that you do. What leads to success in life? What leads to progress in technology? What leads to reduced child mortality? What leads to more airlines going to more airports in the world? What leads to increased in wealth? What leads to decline in poverty? What leads to success, period? Is the human mind, is the application of human reason to whatever problem you have, whatever problem you face or your neighbors face or humanity's faces. It's reason, it's thinking, it's production. And production is what? Production is taking your ideas and applying them in reality. Taking science and trying to use that science to create something that didn't exist before. Call that technology, call that manufacturing, call that industrialization. But that's what the Industrial Revolution did, is it came after the Scientific Revolution, but it required massive amount of thinking, of rational actors, free to think, and then free to act on their thinking, to take those scientific principles and apply them to the problems that they saw all around them, and to making life easier, and making life better, and making life longer. Human thought, human rationality, human reason is what leads to all the good in the world. It will lead to good in your life. If you stop, if you think, if you consider, if you evaluate, if you integrate, if you examine rationally the world around you, the problems you face, you will do fine. You know, barring accidents, barring things you cannot predict. You will do fine. Two if you evade, if you emote, if you're a whim worshiper, if you just go after stuff for the sake of having stuff, you will suffer. You will not be successful. You will not do well in life. You will not achieve happiness, which is the ultimate goal in my view. So if we have to venerate anything, it's we must venerate reason. I mean, Think about all the benefits we have gotten from science, all the, all, the, all, the, all the stuff we have around us that is a product of science and engineering. There it's obvious. But think about our relationships with other people. Do our relationships with other people improve when we think about what we're doing and think about how to do it? Or do they improve when we just go by our feelings? In every aspect of our lives, thinking makes One us minute. better. Using reason makes us better. Reason, the human mind, a faculty of observing reality, understanding it, integrating it into new knowledge, thinking conceptually in, in every realm of life. That is the way in which we survive. As human beings, we cannot survive as a species unless we think. 30. And that is the way in which our life improves. That is the way in which we achieve things, both financially and spiritually. The thing we have, the most important faculty we have, the one that makes it possible for us to survive and thrive, is our mind, is our reason. All right. We're going to talk more about this in a kind of political environment that you need to create to allow reason to thrive. Five, we come back four, after.